everyone is joining now. So I just want to say well, welcome, everybody, to the Trend Atelier's Featuring Lab. This is becoming a tradition. We're hosting those regularly. Prior, they, these were sessions just for our Trend Atelier community. But we decided to open up the space for everyone, kind of in the tradition of the live sessions that we used to have in the school. I'm Geraldine Worry, fashion futurist, futures designer, advisor, and I'm the founder of Trend Atelier. And I'm really honored to be here with other Trend Atelier members who can say hi in the chat. We're a community and a school hybrid for foresight professionals and what I call futuring creatives that are focused on regenerative foresight principles and authoring better futures. So I know that in this session, we probably have a whole bunch of people who have experience with future foresight. So I can't wait to explore the topic from today with you. And I really hope that after this session, we can all walk away really having learned something together, maybe rewired some of our neural pathways. Um, maybe we'll walk out of this session slightly changed. So just also, I want to do a little bit of house cleaning before we get started, just to let you know that we try and make this a kind space as much as possible, uh, because we have different people from different cultures, different people are welcome. And, you know, we're not here to, to judge, we're here to show up authentically and to try and really foster an environment to have very uh, authentic and honest conversations. So um, before I go forward, I have a few suggestions so that you can feel like you can fully participate and we can make this interactive. So first I want you to like get comfortable and keep an open mind. And also if you can just put your phone away so that you're fully present for this next hour. And also if you can just feel like inside a nice sense of positivity inside that in one hour, you'll be out of here hopefully having learned something and having had a really pleasant experience with, with new people from around the world. So um, turn your camera, camera on if you can, but it's not, you don't have to if you can. Turn your sound off uh, unless you want to speak. Um, I encourage you to use emojis and reactions and also obviously interact in the chat. I see we have a whole uh, bunch of messages. Hi everyone. Okay, so I'm going to get started now. So let me share my screen. So welcome to the public speaking toolbox uh, for today. That's really the theme of our, um, our featuring lab today. And like I said, it's for you people who are just very passionate about the future. And so I want to start by telling you a little story about, um, about this, um, what we're talking about today. So this is uh, representing women that were part of the nine to five movement, which was a movement for female uh, rights, women's rights and women's working rights led in the US in the 70s by secretaries and clerical workers that at the time represented the biggest segment of the workforce and were also the most underrepresented, underpaid and undervalued, representing 20 million people in the US. The secretaries were good working wives who were scared of being on stage, of taking the mic, of protesting, but they also also really needed to fight for their rights. So they started forming committees, but they needed to be active at rallies. That was key. So they were assigned by these rally leaders to take the mic and they were terrified. But once they started taking the mic, they could never stop and they could never be shut down. And that is the movement that we benefit from today with equal pay, maternity rights, and more of the women's benefits that are enjoyed today in the U.S. thanks to the nine to, partially by the nine to five movement. So this is just to say that we always learn with the first step, just the same way we learn with the bicycle. And then once we work that muscle, you, you can't stop and fear goes away. And the thing is that ultimately it's the conviction and the belief that is the rocket fuel for overcoming anything, overcoming fear. And then, you know, this is really true for all humans. So um, the promise really, what I will talk with you about today is three things mainly, boosting your confidence, futures leadership and representing yourself 
and the big one also, which is inspiring others and how to do this in a, in a structured way as well within a flow of, of how you present. So, um, let me just, oops, just having a little technical glitch, sorry. Um, okay, so, Hope you can see my screen okay. So let's first talk about boosting your confidence. So the the first benefit I would say I was probably speaking for those of you who've been doing it already, or for those of you who are thinking of, of trying it or improving yourself in that skill, is that um, it develops the, the confidence to speak up. And it's a really good way to step outside of your comfort zone, put yourself in an uncomfortable position to kind of, you know, grow out of your of your mold and, and really force yourself to develop the ability to speak up. And just to say that in our Trend Atelier community and in my own experience, uh, you know, we deal with self-confidence issues and, you know, the fear of being judged all the time. We talk about it in the community. We, we and, um, so it's really about humanizing what we go through in this field of foresight and future and creatives. It's not always about representing yourself as the best expert. Like it's it's really, you know, we all struggle with this. And PC, one of, um, you know, responded in an email prior when I was sending uh, newsletters about this event. She sent me an email. I won't share her last name for, for privacy. And she said, I'm terrified of publicly speaking because I'm afraid of what others may think. I don't usually care when I'm not in front of an audience. So I don't know what, from where this comes from. And she, this must be rooted in childhood or something. So obviously I can't talk about where this might come from for every everyone is a separate story, but there are techniques in public speaking that can really help and have a positive effect on, on your personal growth. Um, and this is something that I've experienced firsthand and I'm sure that um, our, our, our members in the community here can, can echo this. Um, so, I would say, so these are for some, some key tips in terms of building your confidence. Um, so first I would say, whenever you're preparing to speak, even if you're just practicing to speak, even if just the fact of practicing to speak is, is making you nervous, connect, try and connect with your body and how you carry yourself in the world. Every professional public speaking coach talks a lot about body posture um, because in fact, you know, the way we carry ourselves is has a huge impact on, and then how we, we represent ourselves to the world. So, um, you know, for example, Julian Treasure in his talk on, uh, in his TED talk on how to speak to people, say they want to listen um, at minute 0.4 roughly, he, he talks about how to use your voice and power of your speaking. So, Connecting with your body is not just your physical posture, it's also your voice, how you carry yourself, not talking in your nose, um, you know, bringing down your voice a little bit, possibly so that you're not too pitchy, trying to be in your stomach and in your chest. And another thing that has really, really helped me in the past is obviously we're online right now, but when I'm on a stage and I get nervous, like even before today, I got a little bit nervous. So when I speak to an audience, um, which is hard right now because we're by video, I and I feel that nervousness, I look at one person. So for example, Anastasia, I might be looking at you. I won't do it for 10 minutes because you might think, okay, this is weird. But I might do it for just like enough time that it settles me. And then it makes me feel like I'm just having a conversation with, with you and Anastasia. And it's less daunting than just seeing a crowd in front of you. Um, also, rhythm. Take the time. Just breathe. You know, we're all in, many of us probably in this chat are into meditation and self-care. And practice that. Remember to breathe. And this is a really good tip because it's also about intonation and rhythm. So when you're breathing, you can use that silence to bring people into your story. When it's not about talking all the time and filling the time, when you when you breathe, 
it's silent and people can just be like, ah, oh, and it, it creates a rhythm. Props or hands. Okay, some people like to maybe have a prop. Some people like to speak with their hands. Everyone has a way of using their hands. Um, and that's fine, but if you start to do too much or always the same repetitive movement, that that can become distracting. So you're you're aiming not to distract um, your your audience. I have like a few other tips as well. Um, I don't know if any of you say yes in the chat have done sports or have done dancing, but I know as a in my youth I I studied tap dancing for six years and we performed on in big theaters with our group in Paris in front of hundreds of people and our teacher always taught us if you freeze if you forget the choreography just continue just make it up so try and if you if, if you've learned those skills just when you're freezing just move on smile and carry on I, I just remember watching a talk by Simon Sinek who's one of the most famous speakers out there and he was he forgot his words and he was like oh okay, this is not coming to me. He owned it. But don't apologize because we're all human. There's nothing you need to apologize for. When I'm nervous also, I use Rescue Remedy by Dr. Bax. That's like my go-to. It calms me down. I actually took some just before this session. And I also want to say for those, you know, I've been asked, you know, do you use cards? Do you use, use notes? So I'm a, a brain injury veteran. I've had um, one big brain injury and I've had a few since. Memories that not all can always can sometimes be an issue. So I do rely on notes, and and I've seen great talks where people did rely on notes. So I'm not 100 in agreement that you should never have notes. And um, yeah, and then practice. Yeah, okay. So practice, practice multiple times, and we'll talk about this a bit later down in, in the hour. But my big tip is don't practice up until the moment of the talk. Like, take a break, relax. I have found some of my worst talks was when I was reading my notes in the night until the very last minute. Just relax, have a good night's sleep, and just, you know, take a break. But I would say the biggest motivators for confidence in my, um, you know, in, in my opinion, um, no matter what, have... Um, have actually been connecting with your inner creativity and originality. I'm gonna do something with my setup because I wanna see people better. Um, so what I mean by that is like, don't feel like you need to fit in a mold. Don't feel like you need to speak a certain way. You need to be like this person who's amazing. You need to be like this person that you saw on Instagram. Um, if you're giving a presentation, Obviously, it's about how you include, you curate your information and the be beginning and, and end flow. And we'll talk about this a bit later in the hour. But remember that you're going to structure a nice flow in your presentation. Also, if it moves back to confidence, if you're feeling confident that you are skilled, that you are valuable, and you're going to make the right decision. So this means having the confidence that your ideas, your ideas, not Geraldine's ideas, Santia's ideas, Giselle's ideas, your ideas um, matter for your team. Um, or if you're speaking on behalf of any kind of group or if you've been tasked a uh, hire to do a talk, obviously they ask you to do a talk. So they value your ideas and you got this and you know your topic and you have something valuable to share. Um, but I think for me, the biggest motivator, and, and we talk a lot about this in um, the Trend Atelier, is, is um, having a mission, you know, and that goes back to the nine to five story. If you're clear about your mission or your values or what it, why you do this work, why are you hosting this presentation, even if it's a trend forecast, what, why, why are you presenting these ideas, um, then the rest kind of flows and it becomes a core backbone that you can rinse and repeat no matter what the situation or assignment because let's face it your mission is not going to change every month you know so um i'll share a tool that we developed that's free that um if you select a i want to work on my mission uh we have a whole like main email training on this that i that i can share mustn't forget but i just want to keep in the flow of things and um 
And yeah, just don't be obsessed with other what other people think because anyways, it's not in your control. Unless you're like a master manipulator or have special mind reading powers. Plus, every talk is a little bit different. It's, you know, it's a bit like um, musicians who give concerts. They'll have one audience that behaves a certain way and then an audience, another audience that's like completely different. And, and sometimes it's, it's, there's no rhyme or rhythm to it, really. So that's, um, that's one thing. And um, I wanted to uh, move on. Oh, sorry. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, just focus on you guys for, for a moment. So I want to spend two minutes um, just sharing something in the chat. So what I want to ask you is if, if, if you're someone here in the chat who's afraid of public speaking, what is your number one doubt? If you don't mind writing in the chat, maybe you can share some advice or other people in the group can, can chime in and share some advice if you feel like comfortable enough sharing or maybe, you know, this can inspire me to write about it for you or send some advice that you feel like sharing just like uh, any doubt you have about public speaking, like what, what it makes you, what makes you afraid. Just do two minutes. Yeah, Kirsty, that's a good point. I am um, an I as well as a, as a Parisian. That's uh, typical of our accent. Parisians, we do a lot of O oh after our words. And yeah. Yeah, won't be able to catch my thoughts. I think that's where the, it's useful to just kind of slow down if you if you pick up on that, that you're doing this and, and, and trying to develop that self-awareness that it's happening right now and, and what can I do to stop it developing the tools. Suzette so said she had a teacher in drama and literature that told me not to focus uh, on people's expressions and rather look at the audience as a whole as if your vision is seeing the group or just, okay, so interesting, not just me. I think that could be useful also, like depending on, yeah, for sure, on your, your personality. Cora says, I think the main fear is to be relevant for the audience. I'm afraid not to be able to bring something interesting to the table. So first off, just to Giselle's point, which is so good, and actually studying, like joining an improv group or, or drama can be really helpful for, for uh, this type of fear. But Cora, it just blows my mind that you would say that because you're one of the most talented forecasters that I know. Um, if anyone wants to check out Cora or Rosie Kane. So it just shows you that it doesn't matter. You might be like the most brilliant designer and forecaster in the world. You you will still have that fear. So we're all in this together. And as Seja shares, fear for forgetting and the fear of how do I look on my audience eyes and their expectations. So I think there are tips. I have my tips. Giselle just also made some um, suggestions. And I think... I try and humanize the audience and I'm good at conversation. So I try and feel like I'm having a conversation that, that really helps me. And then for the forgetting, it all depends also on the setup, not to get just too technical, but it also depends on the setup of where you're giving the talk. If you've got a laptop, you, you need to like, if you're feeling like notes or references is really important for you, then you're gonna want to really lean in on the setup of where you're going to have the talk. What, is, what am I going to be leaning on? Some, some, some places have a screen on the ground and, and you're gonna have to, you know, ma manipulate a prompter or some, you know, know your setup. That's something I didn't wanna get like too technical about it, but every event, every, is slightly different. So I always find out the technical setup and I always, always have a backup and a copy. I have an iPad, but if you don't have an iPad, try and print your notes. Like I always, always have a backup. Uh, if you're doing a presentation on Canva, make sure you also have it on PDF or anything else because 
not all like platforms and computers are compatible. Sometimes the systems don't uh, aren't compatible with your Mac or whatever it is. Like all these things happen. So just breathe because something unexpected might happen anyways. But you know, it's good to be prepared for these things. So, um, so great. Thanks so much for sharing. I I really really appreciate it. And um, so I just want to talk now about futures leadership. So when it comes to futures leadership, this is something we cover in the expression influence uh, pillar of the world building framework that we follow in the Trinitian. And so this is really about nurturing your futures leadership, which includes self-expression within the practice, which is might sound counterintuitive because Trend foresight is a is a soft science. So where does self expression fit into that? But it does, and and also includes presenting yourself. And the reason is not we're not trying to support your marketing or your personal branding or you becoming the most famous speaker in the world. No, we see tools such as presenting skills, such as presenting, as a gateway to making an impact to create a better world. If you have an important message that we feel would help uh, for the greater good of the people and the planet, we want to help you share it with the world. It's That's what I mean uh, by self-expression, but also presenting yourself. Because at the end of the day, it's just a tool to, to, to make an impact. And so it, there is some obviously cross-pollination with this idea of representing yourself and marketing yourself. Obviously, we can't like uh, sugarcoat it. Um, so in some ways you do, in self-expression, you do want to realize like, what's my personal brand? Like what's your tone of voice in your presentations or the way you write? What, what do you want people to know you for? Are you like irreverent, like a Scott Galloway? or more philosophical, like a Yuval Noah Harari, or are you all about inspirational, like a Gloria Steinem? You know, I mean, that's one way you could look at it in terms of your personal branding and your mission falls into that. Like, what do you want? What's your, what's your mission? Your mission could be small. We don't all have to be like, it's my job to change the world. I must have a mission. Like your mission could be super simple. Like I just want to teach moms to make a meal every day that is easy. Well, not that that's simple, but you know, like everyone has a mission. And so what is that epicenter of your mission could really help you in terms of your future's leadership and how you can then embed that in your presentations, even in a way that's systematized. So um, for example, today, hosting a session on public speaking might appear on the service mainly, surface, sorry, mainly about learning a skill that will help you boost your career and status. But no, for us, it fits into our mission to support uh, future and creatives and forecasters who, who are on a, you know, purposeful mission. And so it really fits and, and completely into our main mission. So for example, for me, for I like inconvenient ideas or wild cards and I remain, remain staunchly committed to the greater good. So no matter what, there's not a single talk or presentation where I don't talk about climate and social justice. Like it just, and if someone is not interested in that, in my talk, then it's not a good match. And I already know it just helps me filter people out or clients out. So the other thing in terms of marketing yourself, obviously public speaking can really push your career for forward, especially if the event is documented and there are photos, it might like make you come across as an expert, but don't confuse uh, honors with achievements. Don't confuse fame with achievements. So even if you don't have those great pictures, but you're doing talks with the most amazing groups, be super proud. Um, so, but I would say that the motivation of marketing yourself as a public speaker is quite external. And I wouldn't lean in heavily on pushing public speaking in my work just to further your career. There has to be some kind of mission led uh, motivator. And so, and, and, and there's a whole host of other issues with that because when you're trying to do a lot of talks, a lot of people want you to speak for free and you shouldn't do that too much. Maybe have a quota during the year, 
a talk you might do for free or maybe a free rate or very low rate for NGOs or like uh, charities, things like that. But, um, and that's a fabulous fact. So boosting your confidence and asking for what you're worth. So, um, so I wanted to, what, what was next? Um, so just quickly to tell you very quickly, this is um, our, the four pillars of our world building framework. And so this is expression influence. And this is a wonderful um, quote from um, Maya Angelou that I will talk to you in a second, actually. I am not organized. I'm talking about public speaking and I'm not um, completely following my own uh, teachings. I had the wrong slide. So, but I wanted to like jump back to um, to another prompt. I'm just gonna look, I see new messages. Uh, Lillian said, uh, yeah, Lillian, such a good point. When you show your vulnerability and when you show that you forgot, you know, it can totally break the ice. And that that is such a great point. So one thing, um, I wanted to ask you for those of you who might have done already public speaking, like Lillian, um, if you've done this, like how was it transformative for you? Like, did it, was there something you really learned from it that you would like to share in our chat today, which would be amazing? And I'll share as well. And that could be um, if you've been on panels, maybe you haven't uh, done public speaking where you've been the only person on stage, maybe you've been on the panel, like, but just the experience of, of having to present, or maybe it was an internal event with your team that got you nervous where you had to present. And who says the power of taking a breath is so helpful. I found helps me take a pause and also gives listeners a pause. Yes, Anush, amazing. Anush is a, is it, if I may say, uh, Anush, you're a trend forecaster, but you're also a accredited meditation coach. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Camilla said, I learned that I don't have to figure so much. I know the content and I can share better in a more spontaneous way. So true. And I'm going to talk to this in our next um in our next so amazing perfect because that's what our next segment will actually be about so give me one second i have to reorganize my slides because there was an issue okay so our, our next section will be about inspiring humans. So I think this is probably the bulk of it really, because, and this is where Camilla, uh, thank you for sharing your questions, by the way, I am so glad you were able to join. And Camilla ahead of this talk emailed some questions, which were great. And so, when it comes to inspiring humans, your number one task as a speaker is to inspire an idea. And um, it's, it's that key idea. And that's even the one that you introduce with. It's the story. You want to start with the story. And um, if you have several ideas, for example, in a forecast presentation, or some type of design presentation where you're showing several ideas, just start with the story and the focus of that idea and just focus on that for on each chapter. If you have a chapter per idea, focus on that. And so just to loop back to Camilla's questions, Camilla, you asked about strategies to plan the structure of the talk before you develop the content. And also you said you're very curious about how you prepare for the presentation and if there's a mix of studying and improv. And you know how you decide on the flow and on the slides. So I would say that the wonderful thing about picking up uh, the skills from uh, public speaking is that 
obviously you can, um, in terms of inspiring humans, you can make a greater impact on causes and matters like meaningful innovations, for example, because you're speaking to a crowd. So even like imagine if you inspire just one person in that crowd and then that person inspires other people and it's like the butterfly effect. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the means to an end and it's something that some of our um, community members use extensively, like Rhiannon Jones, who's a future forecaster, speaker, and Femtech specialist. She's the founder of, um, co-founder, sorry, of Ultraviolet Futures. And she's really harnessed public speaking and foresight to advocate for women's and marginalized uh, health innovations. Or we have Ud Panuti, who is at the moment working with the United Nations as well. As well. She's a Bee Leaders consultant, and she's very focused on, uh, well, she's a cultural broker, but she's also really focused on sustainability innovations, chemicals and waste management within textiles, et cetera. So she utilizes public speaking as well to try and um, push the needle forward along with many other people. But to answer, help answer your questions, Camilla, and um, this idea of inspiring humans and telling the story, Approach public speaking, I think, as storytelling and a conversation. And if you're in foresight, you are telling the story of the future. So, of course, in foresight, there are ways to structure a forecast. And that's a whole other session and something we teach in our courses in terms of drivers and different ways that you can present a report. But even within that, there are different schools of thought in presenting your ideas in foresight. There, there are... Um, schools of thought where you might present the forecast and categorize it by industry. There are schools of thought where you might uh, present the forecast by theme. And I, I tend to go towards more telling the story. I have themes and I try to um, put them together like a puzzle in a flow of a story. And, it, and obviously there's an intro and there's a conclusion. And there's usually an overarching theme. But that's a whole other um segment, I think, for how you actually structure a forecast. And we, we, we don't have, we only have an hour. But I want to show you this um, slide by Maya Angelou. It was a beautiful quote. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so this is really important in terms of public speaking, because, you know, you want to tell a story. And so even if you're working in foresight, which is, again, a soft science, it's around analysis, uh, trend signals, and a variety of different techniques to come to a conclusion and try and forecast the future. Um, when you're speaking, you could be aligning a million facts and a million data points. You will just bore people. What you want is adoption and attention. And in order to do that, you need to step into the storytelling and, and provoke some kind of emotion. And there are different ways of doing that. Like, first of all, you can step into your vulnerability, sort of show up, share a little bit of who you are or your lived experiences. Ask yourself, is there a way that I could perhaps connect my lived experience with this presentation somehow? Is it perhaps an event you went to or uh, an expert you spoke with and it triggered something in you, like is are there things that somehow you can connect with your lived experience? Um, as a you know, as a forecaster or designer presenting, it's not always possible to include um, this. So um, and obviously, if you're presenting to your bosses a very formal presentation, you might need to be cautious with that. So, you know, obviously every situation is a little bit different, but how can you introduce your lived experience? And the other big thing is that you need to somehow show that there, that, um, there is a disconnect in your audience's understanding of the world. There's something they're missing and your idea is the bridge, you know? And you need to somehow show that there's that knowledge gap. And that's how you spark their attention and curiosity. So, you know, there are different ways of doing that. You could do that by 
featuring incredibly pioneering projects or asking really crazy questions or or projecting yourself far in the future. There, there's different ways that you could do that. But try and harness um, how you can spark that attention because you're basically making them realize, oh, I hadn't seen the world that way. Wait, this is interesting. And so that's one thing. When you um, think about inspiring others, also, even before you even start working on the slides or the structure or the ideas, so like set the objective. You know, what do you want the audience to walk away with? Obviously, for this, you need to also really find out who the audience is as much as possible. Who are you speaking with? Is it your team, your bosses? Is it 200 people? Is it investors? Is it artists? Is it um, uh, plumbers uh, looking for innovations? Like, who who is it working in construction or, um, you know? So, you know, I was just listening to a podcast uh, by this money mindset coach, and she was saying how she was invited to give a talk to plumbers to work on, like, who work in the trade on their money mindset. She never talked to that audience. So, and then ask yourself who these ideas or that one idea you're showing is going to benefit. Is it, how is it going to benefit them? Like, is it really going to benefit them? Because if you're speaking, and, and this is important, and this can really help edit down. And obviously, when we're forecasting, we need to do a big job of editing down because we come up with so many signals, especially today. There's just so much going on. We, come, we have to edit down, and this is the identify stage of our methodology, the hunt identify gather methodology that we also have in the, the trend. Activity. So how knowing what how your information will benefit an audience the best and who you're speaking with will help you edit down when you've got say like five or 10 amazing signals and you're like, oh, I can't fit all of this in a slide. I can't fit, okay, what's going to be the most impactful say if you have maximum three things you can, three visuals on this slide. I don't know how, how you present. Some people only have one visual. And also another thing when you're structuring your talk if you're speaking to people outside your organization and you're only talking about your work and your organization, people will see through that and they'll see it as inauthentic. Like I'm mentioning trend activity because obviously I want to talk about the things that we're doing, but ultimately like it's about also just delivering value and serving people. But um, so, but so that's one thing. And so in terms, so now let's focus on the flow of, your presentation, some some suggestions, because obviously all presentations are a bit different. So if you want to gain adoption and keep their attention, in a way you need to utilize marketing techniques. And Rory Sutherland, who's the author of Alchemy and the vice chairman of Ogilvy, um, he kind of has a basic structure. He starts with the story, a compelling and unusual story uh, or fact or idea, something provoking. And then he makes a promise on what he will deliver to give information about that story. And then um, he, you know, then he delivers. And so this is kind of what I did with you today. I heard I shared the story, the nine to five, then I shared what I was going to promise. And then I delivered, I'm delivering right now, trying to do my best to, you know, in different segments. So in terms of the flow, if you're um, only on one topic, try and limit your talk to one major idea. And again, like I said before, if you have multiple trends you're talking about, still try and make them really strong and focused in their message. That's really important. And then make sure if you have one idea, make sure it becomes a consistent thread in your entire talk and give context. It's really important that you give examples, maybe some data, um, maybe you can um, quote some author, author, you know, authorities or credible voices or pioneering projects. You need to bring some context into your slides to give gravitas, but also you wouldn't do that on every single slide. But giving that gravitas gives an additional reason for your audience, a reason to care and to understand the context and further trust it because what you're sharing is being corroborated by other expert voices. 
that um, just doing a presentation with information over information, just data, 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 um, this trend, this trend, this signal, this signal, this signal uh, as a future forecaster and showing all the signals and all the facts, it just becomes a list and then people switch off. So this is where you have to try and humanize the information and create a rhythm because um, people connect with some form of emotional cue. And uh, there was a quote by Karen Eber in her TED talk, how your brain responds to stories and why they're crucial for leaders. I'm just going to quote her. And she says, when you're telling a story, your entire brain will light up. Data doesn't change our behavior. Emotions do. So my experience has been, um, so now I'm going to give you a number of tips, a kind of list uh, that, you know, I'm going to hopefully switch it around, but I'm going to give you a bunch of tips and experience. And I'm seeing that we have a bunch of messages in the chat. So I'll do this and then we'll have 10 minutes to chat and do Q&A. So if you have questions, start bringing them in and, and you know, we'll have 10 minutes to chat. So, um, you know, I have made, in terms of the content flow, I would say I've made so many errors. Even today, I made some errors with my content flow, and yet I worked on hours on this. And, you know, we're human. Um, so it's about keep going, and it's about keep resilient, like stay resilient, keep learning, always be learning. Um, but I will say that I have a template. So today, I wasn't starting from scratch. I, ha I have a design template, and, you know, I've, I've created over time systems um, so that so that essentially um, I can lean on them when things get hard or, or busy or a bit intimidating. I also use a meeting facilitation worksheet. So I have a separate seat in Excel where I literally time, and Lillian knows this because I shared it with her for a workshop she hosted in our community. Uh, it's like every segment. So like if I share my screen, I'll share it with you really fast so you can see. Let me just zoom out. Oh. Are you seeing it? I'm just seeing it. Um, this is the military. You can see I have the time, have the minutes, I have my prompts. Like I'll just start from the top. That really helps me. And um, that's how I work. Everyone's a little bit different, but I would say that essentially this doesn't always work if you are, have a lot of slides. If you have a, like a lot of slides, you might want to you might want to basically put those notes in the slide and then do presenter view. But still, that meeting facilitation worksheet is an amazing way to get started on the time chunks because you want to stay on time. And um, let me just go back. So that's one of my tips. And just, uh, I can't find my notes now. Okay, here we are. Sorry about that. So also another thing is don't hesitate to get training. I was fortunate, like I shared in one of my newsletters, to get some training when I, I was at WGSN uh, on, on speaking. But don't don't hesitate to get a bit of training or just uh, and and don't just look at public speaking. Uh, maybe look up uh, meeting facilitation trainings or um, you know or just listen to how podcasters might speak or just you know you can take various elements and then make them your own from a number of places. Also, keep track of talks where you've had a really good response. These might not just be talks, it might be lectures. And that can give you a sense of, oh, okay, this worked really well. I should repeat this. And to Camilla's point, I think that being spontaneous always works really, really well. Like, obviously, I had a lot of notes here, but I'm still being spontaneous. And I find with, especially with the, uh, when I'm guest lecturing that, the students just love it when I speak to them like they're a person and not just here, you know, ingesting information. Another thing, um, a really good advice and something I have made the mistake doing is don't bang on about yourself 
and introduce yourself for five minutes at the start of a public speaking because you'll just lose people. Try and filter through along the talk who you are and what you do. Don't go into a monologue. Also, try and make it a conversation if you want. Um, especially that is especially true if you're on a panel. Like try and maximize how much you speak to two or three minutes. A big tip is state change. What's called a state change. So if you're doing a, a, a talk, whether it's virtually or whether it's um, here, uh, you know, whether it's on stage, alternate screen sharing and then not screen sharing. Like try and do state changes. Don't do every section the same amount of time. You saw how I broke things up with asking you questions or prompting you. There's different ways that you could break things up because the, the reality of it is that people struggle to pay attention for very long. So you want to like break the rhythm. You know, it's a little bit like YouTubers. You see successful YouTubers, they zoom in and out of the shot. They, they, they create change. And that makes the, the, the uh, that creates a dynamic output and it, it, it um, makes people come to life. It kind of wakes them up if they're starting to switch off. And then I think there's a great quote by um, former president Woodrow Wilson. So if you're given a talk that needs to be 10 minutes, it'll probably take you four days to make. But if you're given a talk that's like two minutes, uh, sorry, two hours, you'll pre you'll prepare it in less than a day. And so um, Woodrow Wilson's quote was, I, if I am to speak for 10 minutes, I need a week for preparation. If 15 minutes, three days. If half an hour, two days. If an hour, I'm ready now. Basically, the shortest presentations are the hardest. So just always remember that depending on your brief. And then um, Camilla, you had a question about practicing. I think it's good to practice. It's good to practice if you can with colleagues as well or friends, especially if you're starting out. But I think um, practice with your script maybe in the beginning, but then practice without the script because that will also help you talk about the subject more spontaneously and give you confidence that you're okay and you can improvise. I'm seeing a lot of message in, in the chat. Um, I'm going to finish up but saying that, you know, when you see my meeting facilitation worksheet and how I've done the flow, you might think, oh, there's not much room for improvising. I do try and improvise. Like, I think it's important to keep things natural, but don't improvise for five minutes because then you'll go over time on your, on your talk. So keep it, you know, keep your improvisation dosed. And, um, you know, overall, just... I think it's about having the formula, you know, I've shared some of our, of my techniques and things that I know echo uh, what we do, but I think ultimately it's about taking what you learn from different places and not thinking that you have to follow one formula because um, to represent yourself, it has to be authentic. And if you're just hashing out what other people told you to do, it's just gonna feel, and also if you use the same formula for every single slide or every single presentation, it's just gonna lose some kind of authenticity and creativity. And I think many of us here are kind of creative. So I think it's really good to templatize, but then also give yourself permission to change things up a little bit, as long as you're not like starting from scratch every single time, which might might not be necessary. And, um, and yeah, so, one last thing I just wanted to recap so that we just so what we talked about today um, really is about using presenting as a essentially a challenge to grow your confidence if that's something that you're kind of struggling with. Seeing this work as part of futures leadership um and if, if you're very mission driven and also just remembering that you really have the power to inspire people and uh you know certainly doing this has given me inspiration to maybe host a session on good ways to structure a presentation because there wasn't time to to do this here today so i think we have like seven minutes to to um to chat and I'm, I'm just going to catch up on the messages i see a lot of messages William said, I'm just also repeating out loud for people who will watch the replay. People will remember the story and they will share. 
if it's easy to reproduce using simple language. Some people had to leave. Uh, Lillian said asking questions to the audience. It's a great way to humanize. Love this. It's a fun way to engage. Ponte had a question. Working on recorded video, teaching speech, and I want to be captivating and interactive as I'm a person. Okay. So pre-recording, I would say don't be monotone and be careful with reading too much from the script and and this happened and then you know like I I don't know like try and like not go too pitchy but but um insist on certain words and um you're not you don't use too much your hands like this on a screen for someone that would not be good like what I just did you know um Lillian gave advice to Santia she said I'd say pay attention to the pace by defining what is the outcome you want you'll be able to adjust it record yourself informally uh listen afterwards to understand if you're achieving the experience amazing tips and uh tone of voice amazing uh Lillian all these these um kind of content really exciting if it's live, it's all about practice. I find it easy in my mother tongue and hard in second language. Yeah, definitely. And I and I think, um, but I, I think Lillian, you underestimate how well you speak. And um, I see other questions popping in. Um, yes, Anush says, I like to think of it as taking the audience on a journey. Anyone else have have, uh, have anything they'd like to share or, or comments? And actually, I'm going to um, put in the chat the link I had said I would share about the mission. Let me just get it. If you go to the um, seeking alignment, I think it's, uh, that's the link. Uh, you'll see that there's, um, one answer is, um, I feel a bit lost with my direction and mission. So in that answer on the quiz, I give a lot of direction on mission. So if, if, if you're interested in getting like, it's like a three email series that we have. So amazing. One thing I forgot to share that I really love and has been transformational with speaking is also meeting people and getting the feedback, especially when you're in person. And you get off that stage and people come to you to talk. I, I find those are my most cherished memories, actually. And also on the panels, meeting other panelists, but just getting the feedback and just chatting with people and getting to understand their perception of the topic and their understanding and what stood out is, is, is really, after doing, you know, over 10 years of public speaking, I feel like that's, that's what I, I might take to my grave, so to speak. Um, Lillian said, it's lovely to talk with people after our presentation. So maybe that's an opportunity right now. Uh, would anyone like to, to speak up and, and say we've got four minutes? Okay, I can share something as I'm on the video already. <laughs> Mm, sorry, I was I'm a little bit uh, a little bit cold. So uh, thank you, Geraldine, for the for the for the workshop, the session actually. Um, regarding from my experience, uh, when doing some public speaking, and I saw a lot of like interesting uh, tips, let's say, and tricks from 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 your presentation, from when you were like getting a little bit on like address what they are doing, like known people in the in the field and so on so it's really interesting um i now work in a program where i need to do some workshops and i need to prepare for a three-hour workshop on design thinking for a female entrepreneurs who don't know even what is uh, what is it and how to work with this so i feel a bit of a challenge how to actually um, make it understandable simple but at the same time interesting for three hours <laughs> so um, um... That's uh, that's why I was thinking um, uh, when joining this uh, this uh, session, maybe to I will get some tips and some insights to to prepare. And I, I did I did get some some stuff, so I will think about this. So thank you for this. Yeah, um, 
workshop. I know that um, someone shared a resource in the community. Um, she's, uh, so I, I'm, I can't really share it, but I will share it with you. Um, because I just took a course on creating a workshop from mm -hmm. a learning designer that I've worked with to help design courses in in a, in the trend atelier and I just took her and it was actually it was really easy to take it wasn't like but it just really really helped me with how to structure the workshop and just creating the activities so she takes you through just some foundational uh, aspects of hosting a workshop and then she actually gives you the resources to to really like design everything. So um, I have your your email, I think. Yes, yes, it's um, it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm going to. I would have to like find the link, and I I, I think we're up to the hour. On this. No, that would be great. I will share it with you. Her name's Emily Walker, and she's an amazing thank you designer. Um, thank you, thank you. There's also cards. There's there's a lot of different ways, and and three hours. Uh, yeah, I, I won't say more. It's really about the expectations of the workshop as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anusha, I'm... thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, no worries. Hi, Kirsty. Just trying to acknowledge the chat. Well, but but yeah, that that sounds like a big challenge, but totally doable. I think it's it's really doable, and um, so I agree on that. Thank you for the for the for the insights and for a great um, evening <laughs> on, on May country now it's, it's evening. So thank you for a great evening for me. Yeah, yeah, and and remember that you know in one hour we just brush the surface. In three hours, they're not going to learn everything about the topic. So it, again, it's about expectations and making it interactive. And, and I would really, really uh, advise you look into active learning and, and that type of thing and interactive design. Okay, everyone, I think we're that's it. We're on the hour. Uh, we'll be posting the replay on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining. It was lovely to see everyone and see everyone in the chat. And I'll talk to you really soon. And, and yeah, stay up to date for our next Futuring Lab. It's on the 27th of September. Okay, bye everyone.